Welcome back, everybody. This is the start of our second year. We're going to be looking here at what we call the visual elements and design principles. So these are things that we could think of as tools that an artist uses in making their work. So we're not talking about physical tools like hammers or chisels or paintbrush. We're talking about more fundamental conceptual tools. So these are the types of things that we study in a very formal way in art training. And if you were to take the Associate of Fine Arts degree at Cape Fear, one of the things you would be uh, required to take would be design one and design two, two dimensional and three dimensional design. So we're covering the same kind of concepts that are covered in depth in a studio course as well. So elements to start off with I wanted to give us the most basic ones to begin with we'll be looking at line shape and its three-dimensional equivalent and we'll also be looking today at value the idea of the relative light and dark so a couple of things to be aware of right at the beginning as we're thinking about line is how is it used and what is it used for so the most basic and in some respects the most important function of a line is to show you the boundary or the outside edge to show you where one thing stops and separate it from what's next to it or what's behind it so these drawings that you can see here by the famous graffiti artist keith herring all have very thick bold solid outline separate one form from another so it makes them very easy to recognize it's one of the most useful things we can do with line we saw that a bit cave drawings that we saw the horse for instance that we saw from the Lasco cave definitely had lines around the outside um, the back downside to it is that it could uh, make your objects appear a little bit flat if you think about it most cartoons or comic strips are done with solid around the outside and they don't look particularly three-dimensional so we'll be dealing with that issue as well we also use line to do a number of different things Arguably, this drawing looks much more three-dimensional than the ones that I just showed you. This is by Leonardo da Vinci uh, from the Renaissance, of course, and it, of a series of drawings that he made that really explore the contrast between things that are considered to be ugly or grotesque considered to be beautiful. So the Renaissance artists very much believed in this um, theory that in order to understand beauty, needed to understand its opposite. So in this case, he's given us a rather strange looking, exaggerated uh, face, someone a little bit older, a little heavier maybe than what would have been considered beautiful to people of the Renaissance at that time. Um, obviously, this is not uh, someone that we would put on the cover of a magazine in our uh, very, very specific uh, culture as far as what we consider to be quote unquote beautiful. Uh, in this drawing, you can see that he uses lines to some extent the way that Keith Haring did. You can see, especially along the nose, that there's very clearly an outline at that point. But in this case, he actually uses the lines to do a lot more than just show you the outside edges. If you follow some of the creases or folds of the skin, there's some naturally forming lines. This line that goes between the edge of the outside of your nostril toward your corner of your mouth is known as the nasal labial crease, and that you definitely can see here. You can see folds in the skin creating lines, what we sometimes call quote unquote crow's feet in the corner of the eye. You can see it separating some of the areas in the neck underneath the chin. But it goes even further than that. Not to show you these lines that we could say perhaps are actual, but you also see a lot of lines that are close together that are not meant to be creases in the skin. You can see really clearly here, actually. All of those lines packed close together are showing us value changes. It's making a little bit of a shadow there. The line is being used in a lot of ways in this particular drawing. We have the outline and the outside edge. We have the contours, the lines that show us the curvatures, like the folds in the skin. Or even here, we could talk about these as being cross contours, the lines that go across the surface, create the illusion of roundness of that form. We also have cross hatching. Anywhere where you have 
one set of parallel lines like these crossed by another opposite direction that make an area darker, we can refer to those as cross-hatched lines. In general, we can divide all of lines and shapes that we're looking at in any work of art into being either more organic or more geometric. And different writers, different uh, artists will use different terminology for these. Some people will substitute words like analytical or mechanical for geometric. Uh, some of the much more dated books even tried to uh, assign gender ideas to these, that organic lines were more feminine. We've moved well past that kind of terminology in 2020. If we look over at the base of these drawings, though, you can see that the drawing to the left is made up primarily of lots and lots of curved lines, lines that look like they came from natural places, or lines that even describe natural things, like the waves and the foam, the clouds. Are there some straight lines in there? Absolutely, of course there are. In the rigging raft, you absolutely see straight lines here here for sure. But the majority, the overwhelming majority of the lines in that drawing tend to be much more curved rather than mechanical, geometric, or straight. This wall drawing by Sal Lewitt is definitely one that uses much more mechanical, straight edge lines. If it looks like it could have been made with a ruler or a compass or by a curve, you're more likely looking at geometric lines. The reason that we class these things is because, of course, we can use organic lines to create a different kind of feeling, a different emotion, a different message than you can with more lines. And we'll see that as we go forward today. Now, one topic that comes up a lot when we're talking about design ideas, visual elements of line and shape, a lot of people get it into their head that geometric lines and shapes, by definition, have to be symmetrical. And that course is not true. The two diagrams I've given you here on the left have shapes that if we dropped a vertical line through the center, you would absolutely have exactly symmetrical shapes on either side, as if you could fold them in half and you'd have absolutely equal exact replication. But these On these two diagrams on the right-hand side, if I drop a vertical through those centers, by no means do I have symmetrical shapes the same on either side of left or right of that center line. So don't get hung up on the idea of symmetry being equated with whether objects are geometric or organic. Remember that they could be either or. You can see that pretty clearly here. A lot of times people think, oh, well, natural objects, organic shapes, like this silhouette of a rabbit, if I put a vertical through that center, he's not exactly the same on left or right in this pose. At these on this side, the leaves and even the human body in silhouette head on like that essentially is a symmetrical form. So symmetry is not the defining characteristic here. We could have uh, either geometric lines or shapes or organic lines or shapes that could be asymmetrical or they could be symmetrical either way. We often talk about using organic shapes in a composition. I had an instructor who used to say that the term composition was about compiling positions, like where you put stuff in the picture. And I like the definition. I think that actually helps me to understand what's going on. So where did the artist put stuff in these pictures? These are paintings by Raphael, and he very often used a simple, basic, triangular arrangement. Now, all the shapes that are in there of these figures are, of course, all kinds of different curves the way they're arranged together overall forms a triangle. And that's kind of an interesting case for us when we're looking at composition. Why a triangle? Well, a triangle is a very stable shape. This wide base at the bottom makes the shape appear to be very centered and appear to be difficult to tip over. In fact, if you imagine trying to push on the top of this triangle, it wouldn't fall over. It might slide left to right going to fall over, whereas a very thin, tall, rectangular shape would be easy to push over. So do you see some organic lines and shapes in this example? 
I'm sure you do. But do you see lots of geometric shapes and lines as well? Certainly in the background are these half circular the straight edges along the columns. We can see between the tiles, straight lines going back in perspective, lay out the grid of the floor. But then you could argue there's lots of organic uh, lines and shapes in the arms, the curvature of the drapery on the figures. But look a little closer and you'll notice that these three figures form a triangle. This figure forms a triangle. And if we exclude these figures in shadow, these ladies form a triangle to the side as well. And each of those three triangles is framed by this geometric tangle with a circle on top in the background. It's actually a very uh, heavy use of geometric lines and shapes. Is typical of this particular type of style. This type of painting is generally classified as what we call neoclassical painting after the Renaissance, a time period during which artists were trying to return to what they saw as ideally perfect art for them, the art of the Renaissance and classical Greece and Rome, which relied a lot on this idea of stability and this concept of telling a moral story. And that's very much what the neoclassical painter Jacques-Louis David is doing with this piece, The Oath of the Haiti. The oath is being taken by these figures here to the left. They are brothers, and they are brothers in arms, both literally brothers biologically, and also, of course, they're soldiers. That They will complete this task. These are their sisters and brides to the side who are worrying for what may happen to them. The, the story that's happening is really kind of interesting. The Harati brothers are some of the leading soldiers for their city, and their city is at war with an enemy army, but no one is gaining the upper hand. The armies fight each day, they clash in battle every day, and equal numbers of soldiers are dying on both sides. No army is gaining the upper hand. And so the decision is made that three of the best soldiers from each army will face off. Well, whoever is left standing at the end will decide the outcome of the war. It's going to save hundreds of people's lives. But it's also sort of a difficult choice to have to make because the likelihood that you yourself, if you're one of the three chosen soldiers, that you might die or your brothers might die is very, very high. So it is a moral story. It's a story about doing what's right, not convenient, taking a stand and doing the right thing to the betterment of the people that you represent. The story is made even more challenging by the fact that the brothers that are fighting for us here in the Horeti, they are going to fight three soldiers from the other team who also have to be brothers and triplets. And the brothers on both sides have intermarried with the sisters. So no, there's no way to win. Even if you emerge victorious, likely your two brothers will have been killed and you will have had to kill the boyfriends or husbands of your own sisters absolutely no way to win this on a personal level, but there's a moral uh, level at which perhaps doing the right thing to save the greater number lesson of the painting really is. Do you feel like you're being preached to a little bit? That's how the neoclassical really works. It has a very strong point of view and a very clear narrative. You could also argue that this feels a little bit like actors on a stage, like they're right at the front of the stage, there's a backdrop behind them, and they're enacting this story for us. But take a look at the composition. If we really look at those shapes, you can see the stability of that triangle. And you can see the somewhat sexist kind of um, commentary on how the female shape becomes a little bit more of a slumped triangle in comparison to the upright triangle of the men. Definitely there's a little bit of shade being thrown there as well. If you think about it, though, that triangle becomes a very logical symbol of strength and stability. If you imagine pushing the top of that triangle, as I said earlier, it won't tip over. It might slide. 
we had arranged the figures in very upright shapes like this, a little push to the top could knock them down. So visually, that triangle just gives us a real sense of stability and strength. Now, you may see some triangular shapes in here for sure, but in the majority of the shapes that you're looking at and the lines that you're seeing, you see a lot of movement and a lot of curves. There's very few straight edge things. Certainly, the background has very few straight lines. This is a competing style that became popular after the neoclassical style had existed for a while. Some artists kind of rebelled against it, and they devised early 1800s that we call the romantic style and it has nothing to do with what we think of as romance like a love story what you're really seeing here is people pushed to their absolute extremes people in difficult situations having to make difficult choices ironically the situation that the characters in the walking dead the, at least the first couple seasons were in is very much in the romantic mode people having to do because it's the best of the few available choices they have. So the romantic style is questioning our morality in extreme situations. And what you're seeing here is a story that's being told. Um, it actually comes to us from a poem by the romantic British poet Lord Byron about a king of ancient Mesopotamia. He was the king of Assyria. This is Sardanapalus. When I first saw the painting and I saw the death of Sardanapalus, I thought Sardanapalus was this character who has the knife to her throat. But in fact, Sardanapalus is this guy back here laid up on his big reclining sofa for his uh, throne. He is in certainty going to be defeated by an enemy outside his city gates. And rather than face up to this like the Harati brothers, rather than go out in glory and, and face people down, Try to save his people, Sardanapalus decides that he refuses to allow any of his treasures or his best belongings or even his closest uh, soldiers to fall into enemy hands. So he has all of his harem women slain. He has his killed. He's got his treasures burned, all of this, so that no one else can get their hands on what belongs to him. So clearly he's making negative moral choice. We're supposed to kind of sit in judgment on him. But you get the feeling of the increased tragic drama that's very, very common to style painting. And that story is told beautifully through all these incredible curving forms. It's also interesting to me that when we look at paintings in museums or in art books or even online, we see the finished product and we think, wow, this guy was really good at drawing people. They looked very real. The whole I could never do that. Well, maybe you can't because the drawing is the step before the painting. We never really get a chance to see this. Do you recognize some of the characters from that painting in these sketches? And obviously the sketches are not as fully realized as the painting, but you can see he's working out poses, positions of the body, different aspects of how the figures or characters might be dressed, but they're done in a little bit looser way. And even earlier step than this is this drawing. At first glance, it looks like a very abstract 1950s abstract expression of Jackson and Pollock. It looks like just kind of blobs and splotches. But if you look closely in and amongst all of these curvaceous curving lines, you can actually see the shoulder, the elbow, the forearm, the head, the breast. That is clearly this figure. And she is at the foot of the couch or bed you can see that here. You can even see there's the elephant head that is the post at the end of the bed. So clearly, out where he's going to place these things by doing a very loose compositional gestural sketch. And when we look at that gesture sketch, you can see that what he's doing absolutely is dependent on the use of curved lines to create the tension and the drama that he wants to create. So line can be made in a lot of different ways. We could define it simply as the path left by a moving point. So we have a variety of actual lines, solid, real, observable lines. More frequently, though, you'll find that artists often like to play with these implied lines. 
where your eye follows those uh, series of dots and creates a line, even though it isn't actually physically there. Same thing is happening here. Your brain perceives a line along that area, but it's made by stopping and starting this linear texture at the bottom. We also find usually dividing two strongly different values or colors. So we can create lines by what we call sharing edges. This is a painting in a very uh, pop style that imitates the appearance of comic books by Roy Lichtenstein. And you can see he uses all of the cases I just showed you. There's actual lines around the outside of the shapes. There are shared edge lines where the white highlight apple just stops and the red starts. And then there are also lines where the black line of the background stops before it touches the fall and creates this implied line around the outside. Pretty clever. Lines also can have what we call personality, or you think of them as having different levels of activity or implied movement. Generally speaking, very vertical lines feel very alert attention and horizontal lines we associate with sleep or with death with absolute uh, on movement with being absolutely still we can also use diagonals to create a sense of dramatic movement and it's kind of interesting to think of the angle of those lines as implying a different level of movement for instance this angle here is much steeper than more shallow but if you think about the difference between an airplane taking off and kind of relatively speaking slowly gaining its height versus a rocket ship blasting off and really quickly ascending you get a sense of a different suggestion of speed or suggestion of action one faster than the other we can certainly apply all of those ideas to the very famous sculpture of Abraham Lincoln. It relies very much on vertical stability in lines. He's very centered and it gives you a sense of kind of the certainty of making sure that the right one in the name of the people, which is what really the statue is meant to remind us of. How about this figure? This is from ancient Greece. This is looking at a body lying in state, as we say, and being looked upon or grieved over by its family members, that whole very, very passive. In this case, these figures are made up of curved lines that are also on strong diagonals, meant to look like they're dancing, even though the sculpture itself can't move. They seem to have more movement than Lincoln does, both of which are fully because of the types of lines and shapes that the artist has chosen to use. We can also see the stability of that particular shape here in this example of Leonardo's Last Supper, but you can also see implied line, lines that aren't actually there, of the disciples around him. At the moment that's being depicted in the painting, Christ has just said, one of you will betray me. And you can see reacting kind of a swirl of confusion and denial and anger and upset this could never be you can see all of that if we put a little bit of attention into the linear arrangement of those figures in space you definitely can see implied lines suggesting movement in this piece by picasso picasso made this painting uh, as really a political statement about a at the point that the world is plunging into the Second World War, Spain itself was undergoing a civil war. And one faction in the civil war was led by General Franco. He had allied himself with Hitler and with the Axis powers, uh, allowed one of his own cities to be kind of a testing ground for a German uh, battle tactic a civilian city to bring the people to their knees and that's what happened they allowed the city of guernica to be bombed and when you think about 
depicting something that horrific. If it was the actual event captured on video or captured in a photograph, it might be too hard to look at. And certainly you've had the experience in your own lives of news stories um, being too hard emotionally or having the feeling that seeing something um, described in words versus in pictures might be an easier way to digest a difficult topic or idea. So certainly an uh, image of people um, fleeing burning buildings and an uh, air raid might be too hard to look at, but by making it a little more abstract, it allows us a little distance. It allows little safety net where we can then confront this incredibly horrible event in a way that allows us to think about it in a little bit rational way. And so what he's doing in a sense is using his style of cubism of seeing things from more than one point of view, seeing things in a fractionally arranged state to really emphasize the tragedy that had happened to the town of Guernica. And you can see that he's also in the piece, your eye almost automatically goes to the central area and back down again. You're led there by this very created by all these lines and shapes and the directional look of the eyes of this figure and this figure. And then that curve of the sun there kind of throws your eye back down again. I usually, if we were in class together the way I hope we someday will be again, I know on the screen and then ask people to call out what was the thing that your eye went to first. That's what we could refer to as a focal point. The artist intentionally controls where they want you to look. And if we look at this painting with a diagram on top of it, you can see that diagonal and that movement that I was suggesting to you with words very clearly in this sort of to show you how the artist is thinking about your eye moving through this composition. The entire thing is a ballet of implied lines. And it's funny, it's easy to think that an artist just goes into the studio and just makes whatever happens spontaneously. It's not really how art is made. It Art is intentional. And so when we look at this composition, the artist has had to think, if I put it might lead your eye right out of the canvas. I need something like this curve to bring you back into it to keep your interest. To kind of direct you to these other shapes that'll then lead you back again into the composition. They've really spent a lot of time, most professional artists really spend an enormous amount of time trying to think about how the viewer can be influenced or directed how we can guide you to see the things that we're trying to get your attention with. Certainly the perspective lines here, we can talk about space as a totally separate issue, but these lines absolutely line up in what we call the coffers, the space in between the top of all of the draperies hung on the wall. All of those angles lead us toward the same point, a vanishing point on the horizon that also is our focal point where the artist wants us to look. Well, of course, the central character in The Last Supper is the Christ figure. Not only in the physical center, but subconsciously your eyes are led there by the implied line of the architecture. And, of course, by the implied line of the fact that most of the disciples are looking at him. And he also forms a stable triangle like we talked about earlier. He is the only stable point reaction that's happening around him. So lines can also be used to create lighter and darker areas. We saw that with Pluto's drawing. So you can think of it like this. By using the same thickness of line, whether it's straight or curved, if I pack the lines closer together and you see that happening here, I can create an area that looks darker by making my lines just get increasingly thicker as well, whether they are geometric or organic. Here you see what we call hatching, the idea of lines that are in a set that are more or less parallel. Cross-hatching would be 
set of parallel lines crossing each other. And the more sets I put together, the closer the lines are placed together, the darker that area is going to look. That brings us to the idea of value. For our purposes, value has nothing to do with monetary worth, what something would be sold for in a museum or a gallery. In this case, is being used by a Cape Fear drawing student to show you the shadows and the changes in light on these symmetric shapes. So we made a bunch of cardboard cubes, arranged them on a table, and put a directed spotlight on them. We would have light sides, dark sides, highlights, cast shadows. And you can see that the uh, student here has really rendered exactly what you very believably simply by using straight lines in hatching and cross hatching. So cross hatching is a fascinating way of creating value, but we can also use line again to suggest volume or the surface of the object. This is a really cool of a bald older male face and it has lines on it that at first glance you might think could be the wrinkles in his skin like the line between the edge of the nostril and the corner of the mouth. But if you really look carefully, the lines here go across his cheek, over the bridge of his nose, under the eye socket, and across over the temple, almost around the back of the head. There's a ton of lines in here describing wrinkles, folds in the skin, and are not outlines. These are contour lines. And very specifically, the cross contour. Those are lines that go across the surface. Specifically in this case, the head seems to be very... So these lines go across left to right to create that sense of volume, three-dimensional quality in that figure. This is a set of drawings done by Cape Fear students in a drawing class. You can see we're drawing soda bottles and hands, but not to show just what the shape object is to try to create almost a map that shows the movement across that surface to make the thing look more fully three-dimensional. When you had to work with a globe in your studies, globes have lines on them that help us to pinpoint places on the planet. We call those latitude and longitude lines. If you imagine that idea over a, a less spherical surface, a more complex surface like the they get an idea of what cross contour really can do. So our next big idea then after line is shape. And I like this one in particular. This is a really cool set of examples that shows you how sophisticated your brain really is. I am sure that you guys can detect a geometric shape in this illustration that isn't really there. It's not drawn physically. There's no outline around it. But you see a perfect because of where these lines in these organic shapes stop and start. It's an idea that we sometimes call culture. Your brain is filling in the gaps. It's using the information available to make deductions about what it is actually an example of how incredibly smart you are, how sophisticated your brain really is, that it's doing this without having to think about it. Can you see geometric shapes in these examples that aren't really there? There's a triangle here, for instance. It doesn't have an outline around the outside of it. Your brain is using these little pieces of information to complete and fill in the missing bits. In a weird way, those simple four dots makes you see a square. So even though this may seem basic to you, think about these techniques, this idea of closure, could be used by a visual artist who wanted to work in an abstract way. One of the things that an abstract artist might do is remove lots of detail. How much can I take away and yet still have the viewer be able to recognize what to see in that image? In this example, you may have seen this diagram or one very similar to it in the past. Depending on how you look at it, at first glance, you might see two faces in profile looking at each other, these two white areas. 
nose and another nose as if they're facing each other. But you might have seen instead the black shape as a very solid, like maybe a fancy candlestick or a flat champagne glass, like the wider mouth champagne glasses of the past. Because you're trying to sort out what is the figure, the object, and what is the ground, the foreground or the background, what we call the figure ground relationship. We can also refer to that as positive negative space, the positive being the subject, the object, and the negative around it, the background or foreground. So in this case, you can probably trick your brain into seeing that black shape as the solid thing and the white as background. Now see if you can flip it the other way. Can you get your brain to see the white shape as solid against a black background? That's your figure ground. So in this example, it's a very abstract one. This is by Matisse. He gave us some blue abstract shapes that suggest a human female body in this space in between them. So even though he didn't make the white shape, he made these blue shapes and placed them your brain is filling in from his suggestion the idea of a female body in that space. It's a pretty cool, sophisticated way of thinking about what abstraction can all be about. So again, the positive is the solid thing, the object, the subject. It's what's outlined here in red. The negative shape is this space that's empty in between the solids. You can take a look here at some drawings by your students and they're of chairs you can really clearly see that even though what we drew was not actually the edges of the chair what we drew was the empty space the holes the negative shapes so in this case the negative shape has been shaded in with black the positive area is in white the reason that this is so useful this is from a really good uh, book that can help you learn how to called drawing on the right side of the brain. And the idea of this diagram is kind of cool. This is a drawing or a pair of drawings by this person on the same day. And the one on the left looks very unsophisticated. The one on the right looks very detailed. That's because what you're is how most people draw. Most people draw outlines around things to describe the details that they know are there. For instance, this object a cart that's got four wheels. But in reality, you would only see if the wheels, or the cart rather, was turned towards you. See three of those wheels, because the fourth one, the one here, would actually be covered up by the shelf itself. So most people are what they think rather than what they really see. Notice here, all those wheels are on the same level. Well, that physically wouldn't look that way to your eye if turned at this angle, the wheel closest to you would seem lower and the wheels further away would seem higher up. So all of that observation is made more in this case by asking the artist not to draw the outlines of the objects, but to draw the outlines of the holes that they see in between the solid things. We call this a positive negative drawing. And by drawing the negative shapes, we often can get much better at our accuracy and our proportion. So in studio, I'll get everything I can find in the studio that has solid spaces and openings or empty spaces and ask the student to try to draw what they see, but not draw objects, just draw the holes. And it really does help us gain a lot in terms of proportion and measure. Accuracy. Again, we've talked about this for a while, but this is the concept of value. We've been looking at using hatching and cross hatching and making marks closer to make areas lighter and darker, you definitely get a more three-dimensional feeling from this illustration than you would if it was just an outline of a circle. The range of value, value is the term that we use for all of the variations from lightest to dark we're able to make using either what we call flat areas of tone or using hatching or cross-hatching. Regardless of how we're does need to be aware of where the light source is, where the light is coming from. And generally, most objects can be divided in half to a light side 
and a dark side. Within the light side, you're going to have an area that's the lightest, that's your highlight, and the object will then fade into that transition from light to dark that we usually refer to as the penumbra, the part that's to the shadow. The darkest part of the dark side is called the core of the shadow, and we sometimes get what we call reflected light, where light bounces dark side and lightens it up a bit. You can see that here. The cast shadow will also have a penumbra at the outer edge where the uh, shadow tends to fade a little bit. So you can see that really clearly in this example. Even though this drawing is done essentially with hatching and cross-hatching, very solidly dimensional because the artist has paid attention to highlight. The light side, the, sh the shadow side has a of shadow in it, some reflected light into that, and then the figure throws a cast shadow as well. So paying attention to where the light is coming from, how strong the light is, and how it affects the object to give us a light side and dark side and the transition between the two is really what the for use of value is all about. We can create that with hatching or with cross hatching. This is a great drawing by Michelangelo. If you look really closely, you can really clearly see thing feels very organic, the curves around the face. He's achieved that with almost only straight lines. It's a pretty remarkable accomplishment. So one thing to be aware of with value is that we classify value into generally whether the values are we can think of value existing along a sliding scale. And you can think of it like notes on a musical scale. The highest values the highest notes, if you think of it as music, are our lightest colors and lightest values, and the lower one increasingly darker. So we could classify this drawing as being mostly low key values, and this drawing is most high key values, mostly light values. This one has mostly dark. And in either case, we have created the sense of the contour and cross across the fabric that's obviously pulled across a chair. Even though you can't see the chair, you can kind of detect it because the artist just paid attention to where the is falling on that curve of that drapery. Last concept about value that I want you to be aware of is the concept of stippling. Stippling is essentially the same as hatching in that it's a series of marks, and the more marks that you put closer together, the darker we tend to use this stippling effect if we're drawing in pen and ink or even in pencil. If you're trying to render something that is smooth texture, like the skin of the cheek of a young person, if you were to do that with hatching, the lines of the hatching might inadvertently make it look like you were wrinkles on the skin. So we can kind of avoid that wrinkled effect by using stippling.